The research I would like to present today is uh, not really on data of uh, prevalence of, <coughs> of uh, sexual violence, but of a policy um, analysis. So first, to give you um, some background, as you all probably know, sexual violence has been considered as a global public health um, uh, issue in 2013 to WHO Health. Uh, the, the World Health Organization uh, issued a world report on sexual violence prevalence and they stated in that uh, report that for Europe, 30% of women in lifetime have been uh, victimized either by a partner in 25% and in 5% by a non-partner. Sexual violence may induce long-lasting uh, sexual, reproductive, physical and mental ill health, uh, which is not only harmful for the victim itself, but also potentially harmful for its uh, offsprings, its peers and its uh, community. Um, migrants have been considered as particularly vulnerable for sexual uh, violence and especially refugees, asylum seekers and undocumented migrants. Whether they are also vulnerable to sexual victimization within Europe and the European neighborhood, which in the, the frame of migration, we have so several collaborations there to stop migration uh, to enter uh, Europe with those green countries, eh? so these are the European neighborhood countries was not yet considered. And between 2006 and 2010, I did several studies on that. And the main findings are the three key findings in the nature and magnitude of sexual vi uh, violence in this uh, group of refugees, asylum seekers, and undocumented migrants is that we found a very high prevalence of sexual victimization, both in women and men, up to 57%. And it was often combined with other types of violence, so not only sexual victimization, often physical, often uh, psycho-emotional uh, and um, socio-economic violence. The violence was also characterized by uh, gang rape and multiple rape and often well, up to 20 uh, perpetrators or 20 people that were involved, we found cases. And another uh, important point is that professionals were, uh, are a substantive part of the perpetrators. In some studies, we found 24%. In the Moroccan study, we even had about uh, 30 or 40% of people in authority or professionals who should uh, provide a service to uh, those refugees, uh, asylum seekers, or undocumented migrants that they were the perpetrators. Some, uh, I'll try to give you some quotes of uh, people we interviewed to um, put in their words how, how they. Uh, experience this. The first one is of um, uh, Mika uh, from uh, Russia and uh, this was a transgender and um, said it, this was awful that bunch of naked men uh, with burning eyes they started to fuck me all. It didn't uh, stop. This person died of AIDS three days after our uh, interview and we got the AIDS through the victimization. Olga from Ukraine said, I tried to abort a child with alcohol and other means. Nothing worked. So I asked a friend to penetrate my uterus with an awl. I lost a lot of blood and was transferred to hospital. The doctor told me, after this torture, you cannot get children anymore. That is the worst thing that could happen to me. This was done to a girl here in an asylum center in Antwerp. And she's still living in Ghent. Um, <coughs> Parvane from Iran uh, said, fear ni nightmares, we all know it. My children can't bear loud voices or noise. They have forgotten, forgotten the meaning of the word joy. So she tries to frame in her own, a phrase in her own words, the PTSD they are, are suffering from. So they all mentioned long lasting ill health consequences while their access to um, health services is quite poor in Europe. So, Knowing that sexual victimization of these groups happens in Europe, we wanted to see uh, how European policies address sexual violence in migrants. And we wanted to examine the extent and scope to which European legal and policy frameworks address sexual violence in migrants in Europe and how the scope and extent impact sexual violence prevention and response. So we did a critical interpretive synthesis of legal and policy frameworks in English, French, Dutch, and German, that were the languages that <coughs> I and my colleague uh, spoke for uh, European uh, languages. So, of course, we are missing a lot of other European languages there. Um, 
the academic literature was uh, searched through PubMed and Web of Science uh, with se on sexual violence and migrants. And we searched for the 27 European member states as of 2013. So Croatia was not in it yet. UK was still uh, at that <laughs> point. Um, and we looked from 2007 until April 2013. We found 187 great uh, literature and 80 um, academic ones. Just to give you a brief overview of our main points, all those policy frameworks started from a human rights approach, but they very much looked at sexual violence as an outside problem. It started with policies that related to sexual violence as a weapon of war. So it is uh, related to sexual violence that happens in the countries where the migrants come from, or trafficking from the countries to here, or on FGM, so seen through a very cultural lens. It's their problem. It's, uh, it has something to do with their culture, where the countries they come from, their situation they have there. Secondly, it only regards violence against women. And also in the terminology that was used in those policies, it started with sexual violence, then it quickly changed into violence against women. And finally, in most of the text, we speak now about gender-based violence, as if the men do not have a gender then anymore. Thirdly, vulnerable groups like LGBTI, sex workers, and undocumented migrants were really not sufficiently addressed in those uh, policies. And the CORI, that stands for Country of Origin Information, uh, that asylum uh, systems apply to see whether people can be sent back or not, um, are really unreliable regarding uh, uh, especially information on how, um, how LGBTs <coughs> can be protected in their countries or not. And then if we looked at how these uh, European frameworks or policies were uh, implemented at national level or subnational level, there were very rare prevention and response policies and tools. We might question whether we have a new starting point now, because there's a European Directive for Minimum Standards of Reception. We had one uh, of asylum seekers. We had the first one in 2003. And also through the research we've done, we've lobbied a lot and they changed that um, directive. That means all countries who are uh, receiving asylums and uh, asylum seekers and who are, are um, providing some accommodation to them should stick to those, uh, this directive. So there are several articles that say that um, member states should protect the physical and mental health of asylum seekers, prevent assault and gender-based violence, including sexual assault and harassment within the premises and accommodation centers. Um, people with special reception needs so should also have um, uh, assistance and uh, medical care. And then um, vulnerable persons, such as minors and unaccompanied minors, uh, people who were trafficked, but also persons who have been subjected to torture, rape, or other serious forms of psychological, physical, or sexual violence, um, should have specific care and should have also have specific accommodation. And if necessary, they uh, should ensure uh, necessary treatment. So we could say that at least there's an opening there, that there's already a framework for asylum seekers within the accommodation centers that they should apply that. Yet we know now that but this is what's after this was published with the migration crisis that nearly no European country uh, stick to uh, um, this <coughs> directive as there were a lot of pop-up initiatives to um, accommodate asylum seekers. So this was uh, not really taken into account at that point. Then we also have the Convention of Istanbul, uh, who entered into force in uh, August 2014, where uh, sexual violence, in the definition of sexual violence, the, uh, it, it, it's based on the absence of consent. Uh, it said that for healthcare, there should be sufficient accessible and adequate sexual assault referral centers providing medical, forensic, and psychosocial care. So in all countries who ratify um, this convention, they should uh, develop that and have that. And asylum seekers uh, are now having the independent right to stay and apply for asylum based on sexual and domestic violence. That's Article 59 and 60. But here again, this convention is only for women. So men cannot apply for asylum based on this. And so 
I would say that this is discriminatory. <coughs> so we say that, okay, we try to do something, but we suffer from some tunnel vision. Huh? First, there is a double interaction of sexual violence and legal status. In theory, we open up eh, for this problem and for people who are being victimized, but in practice, we are still quite close. Protection is very difficult within the centers. There's also legal status hampers the access to sexual violence services. In many European countries, if you're an undocumented migrant, you cannot access uh, the services you need. So we have some uh, uh, problems uh, there. And uh, it also ignores victimizations of, uh, of, of all genders. Eh? The current policy frameworks um, apply a paradigm in which a priori men are perpetrators and women are victims. So we, 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 we do not see a lot of victims and perpetrators there who are in need of effective intervention and who do not get it at uh, the moment. And it's also a bias in research because um, if we start from this premise, it doesn't help us to really detect the real uh, dy dynamics in violence and it won't uh, help for um, prevention policies. So it leads to re-victimization and uh, re-perpetration. And thirdly, that othering and bordering practice really ignores that also at European level in our countries and by European society as itself, uh, we perpetrate violence against those uh, migrants, and that is not yet considered. So we think there's an urgent need for desirable prevention of sexual violence, and that it's really time to drop the blinds and see that sexual violence is not bound to any boundaries. So with migration, we also have sexual violence, and that we need a gender-sensitive paradigm on violence, not sticking to the women, uh, men, categories of women victims, men uh, only perpetrators. We also think that these new policies should um, work to and see human rights to be upheld for all and that they also have access to asylum and to care and holistic prevention and response uh, policies should really be implemented and tested and, and checked for at, uh, uh, also when we are in times of asylum uh, crisis. We think that these uh, policies whether they are at national or European level or at the level of reception centers, that they should stem from a positive view on sexual health and sexuality. It's not because you're a migrant living in a reception center that you should not be entitled not to have sex, uh, not to, to, to avoid sexual violence. And so it should uh, also think about how this can be stimulated in a positive way without uh, <coughs> and still avoiding uh, victimization. As we know that um, victimization at a young age can often lead to re-victimization at a later age and uh, uh, also in some cases to perpetration, we really think that it's necessary to target young migrants in order to stop the momentum from going, that they do not get re-victimized again and uh, again and even maybe become at some point a perpetrator. We do not, we think it's not, um, only something for policymakers to tackle, but that's a, a question of co-responsibility. <coughs> and there I, uh, I uh, uh, applied or reapplied the um, idea of autonomy that was um, developed by the Vest, a colleague uh, of ours, or from more from, from Tom, I think. He said, the fact that you know about such a public health issue, you ought to do something about it. In that sense, he called it autonomy. You ought to do something about it. And so we all have a co-responsibility there. And for that, I would like to recall a manifesto that was published in The Lancet in uh, March 2014, that we are all interdependent and all interconnected. In that sense, we should work towards planetary health and, uh, in that sense, also planetary sexual health without sexual violence. Thank you. One quote to end with, uh, an Afghan uh, refugee went, w that participated in one of the studies said, you need healthy people to build a healthy society. So I all wish you an excellent health. Mm -hmm. And that's the article where you can find it.